chapter 12. Now, here we are again in another Father's Day. And I'm almost really amazed at how we deal with Mother's Day versus Father's Day. On Mother's Day, we often hear sermons that exalt the mothers, that, that talk about how uh, great they are. We encourage them and we uh, praise them. We lift them up as the most important person in the home. And by the way, they are vitally important Amen. in a home. No question about that. Godly mothers are needed. Then there's Father's Day. Dads come to church, they hear a sermon on how he doesn't really measure up as a father. Uh, we preach from the, uh, someone in the Bible who lived almost, it seems, a perfect life. And, and uh, dad leaves feeling a failure that he's never going to really measure up to the dad that God wants him to be. Well, I have some good news, I hope, for you dads. And uh, two pieces of news. First, you are a special person too. I don't think that has become any clearer than in our modern day, how important fathers are in a home and how there are so many without a father and look at the results across our nation uh, of young people who do not have a father, especially young men. But you are just as important in the home as moms are. And then secondly, you don't have to listen to a sermon today that talks about how you're really messing up as a father, all right? And, um, but I, I want to preach today on the world's greatest father. And here in Luke chapter 12, uh, 12 Luke chapter 12 and verse 29, we'll see who that is. I, of course, if you think about it, you know who we're talking about. I know we always get those shirts or the mugs or the hats, you know, uh, the greatest dad or in the world, but this is the world's greatest father. Luke 11, verse 29, And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We'll stop right there. And, uh, of course, I want to preach about that, uh, that great world's greatest father, the Lord. The Lord. And so I, I want to preach about the one that Jesus refers to uh, as my father. Jesus said he's my father 53 times in the Gospels. And But when Jesus talked about the Father, he didn't just call him my Father. He also called him our Father 21 times in the Gospel. Our Father. Jesus clearly shows us that those that put their faith and their trust in him share the same privileges uh, and the same Father as he does. And what a blessing that is. And if you do the research, you'll find it even gets better than that. Jesus calls God your father another 21 times in the New Testament. Now, I'm interested in the matter of God being called our father. And as we do, I'd like to point out some aspects of our uh, connection that we have with our Heavenly Father. Now, I want to encourage you today. I want you to, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know that you have every right and you ought to be rejoicing what you have, that you have a heavenly Father and the relationship you have with God. If you're not saved, we want to help you. We want to help you get to know the Lord as your Savior, that you too can know Him, God, as your Father. So I'm going to preach on the world's greatest father. We'll have a word of prayer. We'll get right started into this message this morning. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, how thankful we are that we can call you that, our Father. That we can come before you anytime, anywhere, and with any need, knowing that you care. Knowing that you want the best for us. And knowing that as an earthly father, I can uh, uh, see how you a deal with us and how the relationship we have, and I can learn much that will even help me. And that, Father, this message today is not only 
for fathers. It's for every living soul here today. So you have your way for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number one, I want to talk about the world's greatest father. I want to talk about our relationship. Friend, if you're not saved today, you can have this relationship, but you don't have it automatically. Uh, we'll see that in a moment. But in verse 30 and verse 32 here that we've already read, Jesus called God our, or excuse me, your father. He called God your father. Now, as I said, Jesus used that designation, uh, referring to God, 21 times in the Gospels. That title and these two verses where it's used in our text here this morning give us some amazing, some precious insight into our relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. And so first of all, it is a personal relationship, a personal relationship. The title, Your Father, it speaks of that very personal relationship. When an unbeliever comes to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says they are born again. And, and at that instant, that person is brought into a very special, a very personal relationship with the Lord. And uh, the, the, the uh, uh, greatest father of the universe. And at, so in, in fact, the newly redeemed sinner, the Bible uh, teaches us that they are actually adopted into the family of God. Listen to this verse in Romans 8.15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Daddy is what that means. But that word adoption, let me focus on that. Adoption, it literally means to place as a son. So that person instantly, when, they, when you call the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, you instantly became a child of God. Many people falsely believe that we all are children of God's, that we are born into this world as a child of God's. That's not true. In fact, if you read the Bible, before you're saved, you're a child of the devil. He is your father. He is your taskmaster. And so, but praise God, we are all invited. There's no one excluded. Doesn't matter a person's race. You see, that's where we don't need to be taught all this craziness that they're teaching today. The Bible clarifies it all. God does not look at the color of the skin, nor uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the sex of a person, male or female. All are welcome to come to the Lord and be born again, be saved, be adopted into his family. I love these verses that, re that refer to this. 1 John chapter 3, you ought to write these down. 1 John chapter 3, listen to this, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, or the children of God. In verse 2, he says it again, beloved, now are we the sons of God, all adopted into the family. You see, in adoption, a child is brought into a family and they're given the same rights as a child that was born into that family. Hallelujah. Praise God. We have the same rights as Jesus Christ has in the family of God. Then secondly, not only is it a personal relationship, it's a very profound relationship. This is a remarkable thing if you just stop and consider it. That uh, what a person is before God save them by his grace. What, what we were before we were saved, there was nothing in us that deserved God's salvation, that deserved to be adopted into the family of God. But listen to what we were. Number one, according to the Bible, the lost sinner is God's enemy. We were enemies with God. Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And then number two, he or she is also a slave to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Ephesians 2, 1 and 3 is a great description of where all of us were before we were saved. Friend, if you're here today and you're not saved, this is describing you. And you have he, of course, not this part, because he quickened us that are saved. He gave life to us. 
who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's where we were. We were dead, spiritually speaking. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The devil is who is referring to there. That's how uh, we walked according to what he wanted us to do. And according to the uh, prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. We were all lost and in that same condition. And uh, uh, in, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so God, we were an enemy of God's. We were a slave to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Number three, in, in fact, the lost sinner is doomed. The lost sinner is condemned to an eternity in hell. John 3, 18, he that believeth on him, praise God. If you believe on Jesus Christ, you are not condemned. I love that part. But he that believeth not, this is the unbeliever, is condemned already. Oh, how sad that is. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In verse 36 of John chapter 3, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Praise God. We, we rejoice in that. And he that believeth not, what do they get? The uh, Son shall not, or, or the uh, Son believeth not the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him right now. Right now. Ephesians chapter 2, we already read those verses. We see the uh, lost condition uh, of that uh, person. And then number four, the sad fact is this. Every person in the entire world who has not been saved is in this horrible condition, this lost condition. Galatians, Galatians 3, 22, but the uh, scripture hath uh, concluded all under sin. Romans chapter 3, in fact, many places in that, that chapter, says there is none righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when you stop to consider the truth about a lost, hell-bound, hell-deserving sinner being saved by the grace of God, that is an amazing, is a profound thing. But when you consider that same sinner can also not only be saved, but can become a child of God's, that is beyond words. And then, then the, the Jews... In that, this time, uh, they had no concept of God as a father. They saw him as Jehovah, the transcendent God. They could have never thought God, uh, thought of God in such an intimate way, that he was their father. And so when Jesus arrived calling God Father, having that personal relationship, it was totally a new concept to them. In fact, it downright angered many of the Jews. And, and so if, if, uh, as we look at this, the Jews had dozens of names for God. And what they needed at any given time would, would uh, determine what name they would call on. Um, and so, first, for instance, if they had a need, they called on Jehovah Jireh. There in Genesis 22 where Abraham... Uh, uh, was talking about how God provided that ram and he didn't have to kill his son Isaac. And, it's, and it means the Lord will provide. And so when the Jew had a need, they would call out God, Jehovah Jireh. They would use that specific name. And then if they were anxious, they would call on Jehovah Shalom. Found in Judges chapter 6, we were just talking about Gideon a little bit. Gideon, he was visited by the Lord Jesus Christ before that great battle. And, and that means that Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. He came to Gideon and gave him peace. Just trust in the Lord and you'll have that peace of knowing that, that you're going to be all right. And then uh, thirdly, if they had, were lonely or afraid, they may call on Jehovah uh, Shema or in Ezekiel 48, which means the Lord is there. If they, were, they need leadership, they may call on Jehovah Rahi. Found in Psalm 23, we know that passage real well. The Lord our shepherd. And if they were sick, they would call on Jehovah Rapha in Exodus 15, 26. The Lord our healer. 
And so there are literally dozens of more names that they would use to call on God. And But when, when these people needed to get a hold of God, they would refer to him all in these various names, but they never referred to him as Father. However, think about this. For those of us who are in Jesus, there is a different name that we can use to speak to God. That name was revealed to the disciples, in fact, right over chapter 11 of Luke. And you know this passage well. Look at chapter 11 and verse 1. Luke 11, verse 1, it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done uh, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, again, an amazing passage here. We, we often refer to it as the Lord's Prayer, but more accurately, accurately it uh, should be called the <laughs> Disciples' Prayer. But here are the disciples who had witnessed the amazing prayer life of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, and, and how he was able to get a hold of God. They said, we want that. Uh, we, we want to know how to pray. And, and I can imagine them waiting to hear the name that Jesus Christ was going to use uh, to uh, refer to God or to call on God. And imagine their surprise when Jesus spoke of God the Father. He spoke of him as Father. And, and in this passage, the Aramaic word is Abba. We saw that earlier. And she was here. It translates into our English word, Daddy. And so Jesus used this intimate term, Daddy, Father, very close. And the disciples, I'm sure it was surprising to them. And, but think, you know, when I think about what I was when Jesus found me, and what he did for me and how he saved me, I, I stand amazed in the presence of such love and power and grace. So do you, my friend. Listen, it is also, it's, it's a permanent relationship. It's personal. It's very profound. And it, praise God, is permanent. Now, regardless of what uh, theologians may say, regardless of what religious people may think, Jesus Christ said it's permanent. When God adopted us into his family, he didn't just say, now this is going to be a temporary basis. We're going to see how it works. And if you screw it up, you know, you're out. No, thank God he didn't do that. He adopted us into his family. It's a forever deal. And uh, he did it for all eternity. You see, adoption, as it was practiced in biblical times, it's entirely different than the way it is today. <laughs> When they adopted someone in biblical times, that adoption could not be undone. Could not be undone. A man had the right to disown his natural children, but he could never uh, 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 disown his adopted child. That was for life. And so he or she could not be disowned by their father. Now this is the same guarantee that you and I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I love those verse, John 10, 28. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and no man shall pluck them out of my hand. And so he, he also said, he, uh, all that comes into him, he will not cast out in John chapter 6, 1 Peter 1, 5. We are kept, I love that word. That's a word you could study there in the Bible. He, he kept, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So what God does when he saves a soul, it still is in 2021 a forever work. And praise God for it. Uh, it's a permanent relationship, profound, personal. And then not only do I want to talk about our relationship with God, but I also want to look at it from a different angle here. God's responsibilities in this relationship. Now, now, understand this. God placed these responsibilities upon himself. He's God. And yet he's going to 
uh, 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 put himself under this, this uh, covenant, if you would, this agreement, and just as a human father has certain responsibilities to their children, uh, God has taken on many responsibilities in relation to his children. And these verses tell us just a few of them here. Look at verse 30, if you would, again. Uh, he has the responsibility of awareness. Awareness. The Bible says, he knoweth that ye have need of these things. Now that verb, the, the two words, have need, is in a tense that means our needs are many, that our needs are constant. Boy, that sounds like my life. Uh, there are many, there are constant, amen? I, I think you can relate to that as well. We are a needy people. And even though we all have needs, and we all have them all the time, that's true, God is well aware of every single one of them. Uh, the word knoweth means to be aware of something. The, the tense of that verb means that he is always aware of everything that affects his children. Now, sometimes we human parents, we just don't know the needs of our children, do we? I'm not going to ask you to give a testimony this morning, but I'm sure you could. How about it when they're really small? That's really the scary time, isn't it? They can't tell us what's wrong. They're crying, and, and I, I don't know what's wrong. Are you hungry? You got a dirty diaper? You, you, what, what, you just angry? What's wrong? Are you sick? And it's, we're trying to figure out what's wrong. But even as you get older, even when they're a teenager, there are times we just, I just can't figure this kid out. I don't know what's wrong. And that's true in the different stages of life. Sometimes as human parents, we just don't know what the needs of our children are. We may not always know, but I want you to know this morning, our Heavenly Father always, always knows. He's never in the dark. He's never confused. What a blessed truth that is. Nothing happens in your life or mind that goes unnoticed by God. Look at verse oh, 24 uh, there in, in Luke chapter 12. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And also look at verse 26. If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, what? why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will, uh, will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And so whatever happens in our lives, it, not, it does not go unnoticed by God. God notices it. He cares. He knows. And I, and I would go even further to say that nothing happens in your life or mine that God has not planned for us. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So thank God he is aware of everything that's going on in our lives, that's going wrong in our lives. Um, you know, you I can't get that little song we sometimes sing jokingly, you know, nobody cares, and I can't remember how it even goes, I'm just going to eat worms or something like that. I just such a negative outlook. You know, nobody cares. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody cares what I'm, what I'm experiencing. But folks, it's not true. God does care. God does know, first of all, he does care. And you have a father that is always aware. And, and, uh, uh, and, and thank God, Job said this, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. <laughs> Job says, I, I don't care how, what bad things are happening to me. God knows what's going on. He knows the way I'm going, and he, uh, I, 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 he will help me come forth as gold. I love Psalm 139. You ought to read that, uh, that, that whole chapter. You, you, you talk about uh, a pro-life chapter. That's definitely one. But God, there, David said, I can't go anywhere where God is not there. 
God is everywhere. God, uh, uh, you know, he, he is concerned for me. He knows everything about me. He was he even knew me when I was in my mother's womb. And so praise God. Too often our, our focus is on the physical and the material. But we also have needs in the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual uh, area or realms of our life. Regardless of what the need is, God knows. God knows it. And he's care, he cares. He wants to help. And then, uh, not only his responsibility of being aware as a, a father, he has also taken on the responsibility of ability. Ability. Look with me at verse 31. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. It isn't enough for God just to know about what his children need, he must possess the ability to meet those needs and his knowledge, uh, 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 otherwise him just knowing about it does us no good. What good is it if a, a great, powerful God knows about our needs but doesn't do anything at all to, or has no ability to help us? Um, now, we know there are no other gods, but we also know at the same time many people try to create gods. And they'll bow down to images of stone or wood or whatever material they may make that God from. By the way, our God is the one that made that material. And they'll, they'll carve that image and they'll bow down to that image. They'll pray to that image, an image that has no ears to hear, no hands to do anything, has no mouth to speak. It is completely worthless, a waste of time. But when you and I pray and talk to our God, our Father, oh, he has the ability to do what he said he would do. It's not just words. Uh, have you ever come across someone that they, yes, they know everything, but they can do everything. You're telling them about what you, you've done, maybe you accomplished a, a, what you thought was a pretty amazing feat. Oh, well, I've done better than that. And they'll give you their story. And you know, I, at least I know in some situations, they were good storytellers. They were great at coming up with the, um, some pretty amazing whoppers, if I, I would call them. But um, they didn't have any ability at all to carry out, uh, to do what they were uh, talking about in the story. And, but God, everything you read in the Word, you may think, oh, that's amazing. That, how can that ever come to pass? Well, God said it, that settles it. He can do what he said he's going to do. And according to this passage, God does have the power to take care of us as well as to know everything about us. Verse 32, for instance, it says the God, that, that the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, the word kingdom refers to all that pertains to his rule. And so it speaks of the power of, of the ruling one, uh, like a wealthy, benevolent king who has everything and, and his children want nothing because he has the means, the wherewithal, to meet every need that arise, uh, arises in his, the lives of his children. He has the means to do that. Therefore, when he says, all these things shall be added unto you there in verse 31, he has the ability to back up that promise. All these things. Many people live in doubt of God's great abilities. And they say, well, God's not really able to care for everybody like this. But I'm going to remind you, if God could speak the universe into existence, don't you think he can take care of you and your needs? Sure can. If he can keep Noah safe through the flood, if he can feed Elijah with a bunch of old ravens, if he could... Uh, put meal in the barrel and oil in the curse, uh, uh, cruise and, 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 and life in the boy for the widow woman. If he can keep the three Hebrew boys safe in the fiery furnace. If he can secure Daniel in the lion's den. If he can feed Israel manna and quail in the wilderness for those 40 years. If he can slay Goliath for David and, and, and take care of those disciples in the storm. If he can part the Red Sea for Moses and raise Lazarus from the dead 
and walk on the water and feed the 5,000 and countless and numerous other things. Don't you think he can take care of you? Oh, he sure can. He is able to take care of you. He is able. Let me give you some verses here this morning that, that uh, just back that up for me. Here in Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do above or exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Matthew 28, 18, 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto, the, spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. Now listen to this. And there is nothing too hard for thee. Oh, I love that. Jeremiah also it said in verse 27 of chapter 32, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? That's a rhetorical question. And obviously, there is not, nothing too hard for God. Romans 4, 21, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. That ought to make even, uh, every Bible-believing Baptist have a Holy Ghost shouting fit. I mean, it ought to get you stirred up and excited to know that we serve the true and living God, the all-powerful God that is able, that cares for us. We human parents may not, may not always be able to meet the needs of our children, but God will never fail. We, as much as we may not want to, we may fail our children because we're human. We make a promise. We can't carry it out. And it may be something beyond our ability. We just can't uh, carry it through. But God never makes a promise that he won't see through. God is able to do everything and anything. He is eternally able to perfectly care for his children. That's you. Christian. And then he has the responsibility of availability. I like that too. In verse 32, uh, we'll see that. I'll read that. You can look at it in just a moment here. But God's awareness of our needs, of his powerful uh, ability to help us in a, in, is a wonderful truth. But if he is a God who is far removed from us, far removed from his children, then his power really does us no good. He must be available. Um, praise God, he is. I would say for us as fathers, I don't care how old your children are, we as a father, we ought to make ourselves available. I've, I've heard, in fact, I just heard this again recently. Someone say, well, I sacrificed my family so I can provide for them what I never had. God has not and never will ask you to sacrifice your family. No. It's more important that you be there for them than you give them all the things of this world. And so that's what God, God is available anytime, anywhere. He has made himself available. Notice verse 30, 32. We are told, we're told here that the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom and I want to focus on two words there. The words good pleasure means to choose, to determine, to be ready, to be well pleased uh, with to do that which seems good. God has determined to be ready for us, to be ready to do that which is good for his children. Now this implies he has made himself available to us. He is available to every one of his children. I have no greater access to God than you. I, it, it, you and I have equal ability or access. God has made himself available to all of us as Christians. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And he says, I will give you rest. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 5, I love that verse. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. In, in Matthew 28, 20, he said, I'm with you always. And there it's at the end of that great commission. He said, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. He is close to us. He is 
as, as, far, as close as a prayer away, a simple prayer of faith, he's there. There are times when we human parents, we're just not available as we should be to our children. Sometimes we're busy. Sometimes we may be estranged from them. Sometimes one problem or the other gets in the way. But that's not true of God. No, he is always near. He is always available, day or night. You can call on him, and he's not going to say, wait a minute, I'm busy. Give me five minutes. Uh, let me finish this project, and I'll be right with you. No, he's there immediately, anywhere, anytime. Praise God. He is always there, uh, day or night. He, he perfectly executes all the responsibilities that he has placed upon himself. He does all of that perfectly all the time. Praise his wonderful name. And then let me close with this thought here. We've looked at our relationship, the responsibilities that God has toward us that he's placed on himself. And then thirdly, I want to talk about our role as his child. Uh, verses 29 now through verse 32, we're going to focus on those verses. While we can count on God doing his part perfectly, and he will, there are times when Quite frankly, we fall short of doing this. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have a role to fill. Sometimes we have the attitude, well, I'm saved, praise God, that's enough. Oh, God has given you and I a role to fulfill. And you're not going to be obedient unless you do it. You're not, I'm not going to say that you don't have a relationship. You have that, that's guaranteed, that's forever. And, uh, uh, but let me, let me get right into this. First of all, uh, we must have faith. Faith. Um, notice what the Bible says there in verse 29. We are commanded neither to be of doubtful mind. Now, this phrase means to be uh, agitated or harassed with cares. It is a term that was used to describe a ship that was being tossed about during a stormy sea. And so here it is used as a metaphor for worry. Now, now look, if we, we look at this, we all can relate to this. Jesus is saying, child of God, don't allow your mind to be tossed up and down by the waves of worry, doubt, and fear. Don't allow that to happen. Verse 32, we're told to, notice those two words, fear not. Now, that phrase means to be uh, uh, out to flight, to be seized with fear. Um, this may not mean much to you, but the command is in the, what they say is the middle voice. It could be read this way. Do not allow yourself to be seized with fear. Oh, I thought how fitting it is in our day and age right now. We have people all around us who have been seized with fear who have been in, imprisoned with fear. And that ought not be Christian. Uh, that phrase, we, you know, again, you know, tells us that we don't have, we can trust the Lord. That's what we need to learn to do. And he's challenging us to do that, to learn to trust God regardless of what the circumstances may be like. Regardless of what may be going on in our world. There are times when it may appear that there is no solution at all. I want to encourage you today, never count God out. You say, well, this is impossible, Pastor. In this situation, I don't know how I'm going to get through it. I don't know what any good that can come out of it. Don't count God out. Learn to look away to him, to trust in his power in every single circumstance of life. Uh, listen, Mark chapter 11, a couple of great verses here. Uh, Jesus saith unto them, he's answering, it says unto them, have faith in God. I believe he would say the same thing to you and I today. Don't look at all the circumstances. Don't look at what's going on in our world. Have faith in God. He goes on, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he saith. Listen to Mark 9, 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all these things are possible 
to him that believeth. Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah, that word, think on these things. So always remember that we serve a God who is sovereign, who is sovereign. What, what do I mean by that? I've said it over and over again this past year. But what it basically means, he is an absolute control. Not the Democrats, not the Republicans, not, uh, uh, not the virus, not uh, the devil, not any other thing or people you could throw in there. God is in absolute control. Even when things look impossible, they are not. If God is in control of them. Now, trust in the Lord. Whatever, um, he, you know, he, he allows things to happen in our lives. Uh, for we, we may never know all the reasons why. But he will uh, allow you to be, uh, uh, he will never allow you and I, Christian, to be put to shame. He won't allow it to happen. Romans 10, 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Woe unto us, Christians, when we cower in shame because the world is so loud and vocal in their crazy beliefs and ideas. And we, we, shirk, we, we, we shrink back from, from speaking up for the Lord because, well, boy, I don't want to get into any kind of confrontation. And I don't, I don't like confrontation, but we need to stand with the Lord. Let him fight our battles for us. Use his word. Speak with love, with compassion, and so we must, we must be um, faithful. Verse 31, if we, um, if we will experience the awesome power of God in our lives, and I know that we as Christians, we want that day by day, we must learn then and return to be faithful to the Lord. Faithful. In other words, he must come first. God must come first. The word seek in verse 31 means to crave something. We are to crave. Uh, you know what that word means. If, if uh, you're expecting a child, you ladies, you know you have, maybe have different cravings. Uh, sometimes it can be rather strange things. Um, but we all have our cravings, don't we? We, we? But we are to crave or desire the things of God ahead of all other things in our life. We are to desire those things above everything. When we pursue the spiritual God will always take care of the material if we are pursuing the spiritual. Put him first. Put God first. And then when, when he is first, you'll never have to worry about all the other things that it says here. He'll take care of all those things for us. So now, don't, don't misunderstand me here. God remains faithful even when we, we fail him. And when we ignore him, listen to this verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. But even though he may go on being our father, we're, I'll guarantee you, we're going to miss out on the best that he has for us if we don't put him first. Um, let me encourage you this morning to examine your life, to examine the priorities in your life. If God, if his word, if time with him every day, uh, the house of God, uh, if we can go on and on all these things, if they're not a priority in your life, then let me encourage you to take whatever steps are necessary to make them a priority, to get that straightened out. Remember, when you put him first on, the, on that priority list, he's not just in the top ten. He's one of, you know, I've said this before, it's like going to your wife and saying, uh, honey, listen, of all the women in the world, you're one of the ones I love the most. What? One of the ones? No, she don't want to hear that. She wants to hear, no, you're the only one that I love with all my heart. And that's what God wants. He wants to be first, wants to be even above our spouse. Um, and he ought, ought to be. So remember, when, when, it, when you put him first in a prior, priority list, he will keep you at the very top of his list. So let me close. Look, God 
truly is the world's greatest father. The fact that he would love the unworthy individuals like you and I, that he would save us by his grace, that he would adopt us into his family, that he would provide for us. Add to the fact that he, he looks out for his children. He takes care of them in a, honestly, a spectacular fashion. <clears throat> I would say loud and clear today, I am glad that he is my father. Amen. I am glad that he is my father. Now, how about you? Can you honestly say, preacher, I am saved by the grace of God. I know that he is my father. I know that I am his child. If you can't say that, I invite you this morning to come and put your faith in Jesus Christ. We'd love to help you uh, know how to, that you can be saved. If you are saved, can you honestly say that God, that the business of God has the first priority in your life? You know that. I don't have to point it out to you. If not, I invite you to come to him. Make him a priority. If you're a child of God and maybe you have needs in your life, you need help, who, who doesn't? There is no better place to come and bring those needs than to this old-fashioned altar before God, our Heavenly Father himself. So I invite you to come today. If you know the Father, you know his, his uh, wonderful, the relationship you have with him, and you know how wonderful he is, Maybe you ought to just come today and just thank him. I, I believe he likes that. I believe he likes to hear us thank him for all he's done for us. Let's bow our heads together here this morning. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be able to call you that, knowing that we have one who is always with us, who truly cares for us, who has all the power and the ability to do what you promised you're going to do. Father, I pray that right now, all of us would search our hearts. As a Christian, I know, we know, that we serve the greatest Father in the world. And I pray that we would express that by making you a priority in our lives. And the things that, you, that pertain to you. I pray for anyone here that's not saved. May they come and be adopted into your family today. So your will be done, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.